each task, each building is the search for the ideal, for the best possible solution. So the old term of the genius lozi, the spirit of the place, I think is very important. I'm, I'm not a regionalist, don't get me wrong. I believe in the contemporary architecture. I would like to introduce my wife Petra Benisch. My name is Stefan Benisch. We have worked since the beginning of the office together and in the year 2003 we then moved to this office here. Let's go in. My personal passion for architecture began quite early. I am the son of an architect and all our traveling and vacations moved around architecture. When we traveled with our parents, it was always about visiting architecture. And then my passion for architecture sort of cooled down a little bit because it was omnipotent, it was always there. And after I had finished school, everybody had expected me to study architecture. And so I decided to become a journalist. I didn't study architecture, I studied philosophy and economic sciences. But then after I had finished philosophy, I became an architect and I never regretted it. So it's rooted in my biography, the architecture, and always was part of my life. I would say my approach to architecture was more from the philosophical side and the humanistic side than from the pure aesthetical or design side. I was always interested in the broader field of architecture. Not only the design, but also in the humanistic part, in the educational part, pedagogical part. All these fields interested me very much. So for me, architecture was always sort of an integration of our life. It was never as that you would say, like some architects say, it's the passion because I want to design this. It was always more about the passion of the integration of our society in the architecture, of the political dimension of architecture, of the humanistic dimension of architecture. My name is Maria Hirnsberger. I'm a studio director at Benisch. The Max Eichert Arena is the first project where we did parametric design, but not just in a way that we designed a nice facade with it, but we also did it in a way that we designed the technical aspects with it. At Penish, even if you're a really young architect, you have idea, you talk through the idea with the partners, with Stefan Penish, and then in the end the building can look like you imagine it. The Max Eicher Arena is a speed skating rink in Bavaria, in a beautiful setting, it was built on top of an existing older ice skating rink, speed skating rink. And we had finished the building in 2011. What I didn't know before, a speed skating rink is a very complicated matter. So there were a lot of things we had to think about. The daylight coming in, but not the sun coming in. So all these aspects and the construction of the daylight, we had to write a script. So you could say, in this case, the form follows the function. So it was the largest wooden structure we ever have built. The widest span, 300 meters is not bad for a wooden structure, by roughly 90 meters. 
And we work there together with several engineers. The climate engineers was very important because the visitors on one side, the ice very close by, should not interact. So the way the air was simulated, the air and the heating works and the cooling works, so it never interacts between ice and the visitors. So the engineers' information made a great difference in the way we designed this building. It represents our way of working very well because of the interaction. One of the most important people we worked with here was the ice meister, the person who makes the ice. And it's, it's a science. It's not just making ice. It's a science in perfection. We are no specialists on ice. We can't know that. But we get all the information from the other people in there informing the design process. And that was, I would say, in a very narrow way, the perfect representation of how we work. The architecture is a medium or an instrument for me to help making a better world, maybe, even though that's very high. <laughs> but or to serve society, it's not a self-serve purpose. For me, sitting there and doing beautiful buildings that do not really serve society was never of interest. Um, my name is Stefan Rappert. Um, I'm the partner of the office from Benish Architekten here in Stuttgart. I'm Cornelia Wust, director at Benish Architekten, and I was responsible for the Adidas Arena project um, during design phase and construction phase. We, we want to provide the best working places on, on earth world, worldwide. I mean, this is just one sentence. And we as architects, we have to, we have to generate a broader design idea out of that. So that means technical aspects together with architectural approaches, you know, how, how is that linked together? And, and you see here on, on, on that model, which helped us a lot during the design process as well. You see here some of this kind of fancy stuff, the facade. We have this facade around the lifted box about this, uh, this club, these working spaces. So we have this fixed sun shading device developed um, in that way that's protecting from the direct sunlight. The client was a little bit afraid, especially the users were afraid. Um, what does it mean having kind of a structure in front of my window? Yeah, And we could face this only by yeah, promise them we are gonna building a model, a real one-to-one -one model. So we do them, did in the beginning a visual mock-up. And this visual mock-up we built on site, that means close to the construction site, close to the campus site. So all the future users had the possibility to pass by and see what this facade will look like. And from that point on, this kind of a extra structure in front of the window never was a point again because it's like the window boxed as you have a typical house, a typical floor. The challenge was really that the, to keep the sun out, the direct sunlight out, but of course the much as possible of the indirect daylight in. It's not just a formal element, you know, it's, it's a, it's a fix, fixed sun shading device. Which, which provides the building a, a certain character. But on top of that, and this was the main driver first of all, 
it's also to say it, it has to work together with, with technical aspects with sustainable approach. What does it mean going with a, with a fixed sun shading element and what does it mean in regards to providing shading and providing the best um, daylight conditions inside. Our projects were always aiming, I would say, very high. We were never the masters of compromise, I would say. Each building task we have to consider from scratch, from the new, because each situation is a different one. There is no pre-thought solution. My name is Nadine Hoss and I'm working as Danish architect and as an architect. So when we were designing that building, we were challenged by the task that we actually had to build a building of that giant scale. It was really huge. And that was the point where we said we have to somehow uh, create identities within that huge building so that people get help to like rediscover corners that they know and to help them to distribute within the building. And so it came that each entrance to the working areas that we had that are going like that are coming from the lively magistrale gets one specific identity and it got one specific color and therefore one specific atmosphere that that could be re like that people can see and they remember ah yellow is my entrance actually Danish Architekten is an office right now in four locations. We are not very ideological formally in our architecture. For us, the approach is more from the content than from a pre-perceived or preconceived formal approach. So my name is Matt Noblet. I'm a, a partner at Danish Architecten. Um, I'm responsible for the office here in Boston. I think it's been interesting for us to work not just in Boston, but in the US. We come from a kind of tradition of, of sustainability and a building tradition in Germany that's been very interesting for us to bring to the US market and to figure out how, how do these two things go together. <laughs> So this is the Harvard uh, Science and Engineering Complex in Alston, um, which is a kind of an, it's, it's a, sort of the last unbuilt neighborhood of Boston. And we won a competition to design a new, uh, basically science and research campus. So we began that project and designed it, uh, and we actually built the foundations. Uh, and then the project was stopped in 2008 due to the financial crisis and the sort of global economic meltdown, as they called it. <laughs> This was thinking about, for me, more a sobering moment, thinking about how political, how deep in the political realm do we want to be with our projects. We cannot avoid politics. I'm not interested just to build another building for a developer, but almost half of our projects were never built.
Then in 2012, 2013, Harvard reapproached us and said, well, we'd like to, you know, we think it's time to restart the project, but we have a completely different set of uses and a completely different program for the building. So we had a basement structure, a foundation structure that was built for one use. And then they came back and said, actually, instead of life sciences and biology type research, it's going to be science and engineering, which is a very different prospect. These are rooms with big spans and they need a whole different, an entirely different structural approach. Uh, it was a huge challenge. When the project restarted, um, there was a, a desire to make the building much more efficient and try to sort of get more researchers in and, and get a lot more use out of the building. Architecture is a very prominent human artifact. It defines us time and place. When we think about a city, any city, we know, let's say New York, Paris, Rome, Milano, whatever we are, we always think architecture. Most of the time, we don't even see individual buildings. We see the public realm. Alston is a very uh, residential, very uh, low-lying neighborhood type of uh, environment. It's, in, it's still within the city of Boston, but it's very, it has very small buildings everywhere. And suddenly we were coming with not only this building, but an entire campus of future buildings, and we had to be the first one. We had to sort of arrive there and tell people that who have a little house over here, oh, by the way, this is going next to your, next to your house. And, um, and so what you see in the architecture is a kind of a response to that. The street that runs along the northern side of the building is called Western Avenue, and that's understood as a more urban experience, a place where you could have a more building height and you could, you could treat that more like a street wall condition. But the southern part of the site, really the building starts to sort of break apart and step and have these terraces. So these are all green roofs here that are occupiable, uh, and the scale of this is almost residential as you kind of step down and then we've created this large courtyard and then beyond that is a kind of a landscape buffer zone before you reach the houses. There were a lot of interesting things that, things that we did on the project, uh, probably the most, of, most interesting of which was uh, this uh, solar shading screen that we developed for these, these boxes, the floating boxes, uh, in which we, we really figured out or calculated according to the solar orientation of the building what the optimal shading geometry would be for these kind of small hoods which you can also see in some of those photographs over there uh, and then used uh, parametric modeling software to really fig deploy that on all the four sides of the building and then give it some variation so we knew it we wanted it to be a very high performing screen something that would cut down on solar gain and enable a lot of the more passive systems to condition the building on the inside but we also wanted that to be something a little bit playful as well, so that there's a pattern that kind of dances across the facade. And so each of the, fa the, the, the orientations has about four panels, four panel geometries that uh, are blended together to give this a kind of a, almost like a textile kind of feel to the outside. And then also to sort of mitigate the mass of these boxes. A lot of German architects are designing around principles. The problem with principles is that they are always rooted in your past. So I don't trust principles very much. Each task, each building is the search for the ideal, for the best possible solution. So the old term of the genius lotsi the spirit of the place, I think, is very important. And I'm not a regionalist, don't get me wrong. I believe in the contemporary architecture. One of the great or big shortfallings, shortcomings of the international style was that we thought we could build at each place, in each climate, the same building. And that was possible with an abundance of energy. That was possible because energy was cheap. We didn't talk about global warming. We didn't talk about climate crisis. We could use whatever energy was available. And that was a mistake. 
Where is the point to build a glass tower in Dubai? It doesn't make sense at all. Yeah, it only works because energy is cheap there. So I think we have to react to the cultural context and climatic context. I would consider sustainability in the broader context to say it should be enjoyable buildings, it should be good buildings, functional buildings, and ideally buildings that when they had outlived the purpose, they can be easily repurposed, reused, changed for different uses, are flexible enough, or could disappear without a trace. I'm Jörg Usinger, I'm one of the partners of the Stuttgart office of Banish Architect. The Dorothea Quartier in Stuttgart, uh, a project we recently finished about May 17, and it was a really long time we worked on it. About It started 2010 with an international competition with 10 offices. We won this competition. It was the backside of the city, but even in the prominent location, just in the middle of the city, it was not a good situation because after World War II, they cluttered up the masses and it made it very slow and very narrow and you don't want to go in there in the evening. They started with a competition we won it and, and we had a big two uh, block situation we won and I think the reason we won because we were one of the only teams who opened the sidelines and, and, and shaped the houses back and so we opened the sideline again from the Stiftskirche to the Breininger backside and further to the, to the Bohnenviertel and, and we created new public realm, new places like the Sporerplatz and the Dorotheenplatz and that was one of the reasons we won. And we were about 20 persons you talked every time. We had about 25 engineering firms, means about 70, 80, 100 engineers working on these things. We had about 30 contractors, so at least 200 people. And it took all these guys and, and, and all these women, and it took long, long rounds every year, every, every week to talk with them and, and, and to, to get the bet out of them. Yeah. My name is Christine Napolitano and I'm currently one of the studio directors at the Boston office for Banish Architecton. Definitely one of the things that I enjoy the most about this office is the fact that it's a very collaborative office. So all of the team members I mentioned, you know, we are working on the Harvard project. A lot of people in this office are working on that project currently. And it's really a collaborative process between the whole team, developing different parts of the building and everyone really being interested in the parts that they're working on and really devoted to making it a better building. So I'd say that collaboration is definitely at the forefront of what we're doing here. My name is Teresa Kessler. I'm project leader in the office of Stuttgart. I'm working here since more or less 10 years and I like it here very much. The three offices, they meet like once a year, all offices together, so everybody sees each other, talks with each other. We have workshops, we have the Christmas parties, which are important as well, and it's really important to see each other face to face. My ideal, my dream, the idea of an office where many people can contribute to a similar or a same goal and are able to redefine the goal because time changes. The goal project is a project we do in our Munich office and uh, Robert Hösler is the partner responsible for the Munich office. The purpose of the project, it is 
a meeting center for the company Gore. It is a competition we just had won just a few weeks ago, and it's a project for their future. Our design approach was rather, I would say, a bit unusual architecturally compared to most other designs because we didn't approach it from a building. Here we actually did design the functions and the, the functions informed the design of the building. The idea was to create a building that can be reused, repurposed or demolished at one time in 50 years and disappear without a trace. We look more into the idea of the deconstructivism and constructivism than on the pure classic modernism. So for us it was an idea to think contemporary architecture further, to look beyond the pure functional elements of a building or the pure aesthetic elements of the building. It is rather a gathering of functions where each of the elements of the building frees itself and can live its own purpose. I would say the emancipation of the elements in a building. The future is where we can do it. Generally, if you look at the life cycle of materials, the less manufactured they are, the more pure they are, the, the more sustainable they are normally. It's a bit like nutrition. The less processed it is, the healthier it is. My name is Thomas Weitzel. I'm a project manager with Vinish. I've been here for 12 years now. So in this building, actually we use uh, rammed earth. It's also a material that actually can be completely reused. Uh, we use a lot of wood. Wood actually stores um, carbon uh, dioxide. So we actually embed CO2 in the building. We don't release it during construction. Uh, so in that sense, it's definitely a topic for the future uh, to see where this building going and we build an environment that's sustainable for the future. My name is Michael Coker. I'm a studio director at uh, Banish Architect in Boston office. Definitely the material of the future would be wood, I think. Just the fact that it, you know, it sequesters carbon and it's renewable. Um, I think more and more now in all of our projects in North America, uh, people are considering it. It's just a matter of making sure that there's manufacturers out there who are, you know, there's enough of them where it's actually um, economical, I would say, at the, for the time being. Right now, there's just not enough manufacturers out there, so it's hard to compete with steel and concrete. Natural materials generally are more sustainable. Said that is the building volume of mankind we cannot do only with natural materials. We, they are not enough around. But I think we have to experiment to find out how can we maybe in future engineer natural material so they fulfill all the purposes we need them to do. Be curious, be brave, be experimental, and enjoy what you do. And it's an enjoyable profession. It's sometimes critical, sometimes fr frustrating, like all professions are, but I would say generally think beyond traditions, think beyond past experiences.
Thank you.